Hello, and welcome to this Oracle Cloud World presentation. I'm Orlando Gentil, Oracle University instructor, and I'm glad that I, you give me the opportunity to show you more about OCI. In this session, I will give you a brief overview of the OCI Identity and Access Management Service. We already know that IAM stands for Identity and Access Management. But what does it mean in an OCI realm? IAM is an OCI service, and it controls access to the OCI resources. It ensures that the allowed actors have the proper authentication, and it also ensures that the actors have the right permissions, also referred to as authorization. To understand more about OCI IAM, we will see the concepts that you need to know in order to make things work. The first concept is identity domains. Identity domains were introduced in November 2021 and changed how OCI works, adding a way to represent different user populations, each on their respective grouping, making it easier to manage and organize. Identity domains comes on different types according to what you need and the requirements. When you create an OCI tenancy, a free identity domain is provisioned, and it's what you will use to manage the access to your infrastructure and past resources. It is possible to use Federation to integrate with external identity providers, like an existing Active Directory in your company. If you need more limits, like more than 2,000 users, or features that are not included, it is possible to change the domain to another type. Many Oracle applications provision an identity domain for their users and include everything you need with it. If you need to use more advanced resources to enhance authentication and authorization or mix them with other environments, that is when you need to use an identity domain of the Oracle Apps Premium type. If you are standardizing on Oracle as your enterprise identity and access manager provider, this is the identity domain that you will want. It will help you to manage workforce authentication and access to all your Oracle and non-Oracle applications, whether they are SaaS apps, on-premise enterprise apps, or apps that are hosted in the cloud. Finally, the external user identity domain type offers the same capabilities as the premium, but in this case, you want to provide IAM services to non-employees use cases, consumer-facing IAM, and custom app developers. This functionality provides relevant features for those scenarios, such as user self-service, social login, and consent management. Compared to the previous IAM service uh, on OCI, the change is that now each bundle of users can be grouped separately, making it easier to organize and write the appropriate policies. From the tenancy itself to block volumes, VCNs, instances, everything on OCI is a resource. But how are resources identified? Each resource has a unique Oracle Assigned Identifier, or OCID for short. The OCID has the, uh, it starts with the OCI version, OCID 1, the resource type, the tenants, instance, or VCN, the realm, that will be if it's a commercial region, government, or federal government. Uh, the region represents the region the resource is, and if the resource is the tenancy, it will be blank, as the tenancy is a global resource. There's a field reserved for future use that is currently blank, and, it's, and at last, we get the unique ID. Here you can see some examples of OCIDs. One for a tenancy. So after OC1, you can see the two consecutive dots making the region field empty as the tenancy is a global resource. And in the other is a volume as is stated in the type and located in the Frankfurt region. The next concept in our list is the compartment. A compartment is a logical construct that groups resources. The first compartment you will see in your tenancy 
or compartment is a root compartment. Compartments can be used to group related resources, like shown here, where we have a network compartment that contains resources from the network and a storage compartment with storage related resources. Compartments will isolate logically and allow permissions to be granted granularly. Although the root compartment can hold all your resources, the best practice is to use compartments to organize your resources and how permissions will be assigned. Compartments are unique attributes of the resources, meaning that each compartment can only be placed in only resources can only be placed in one compartment. Compartment define where policies will be applied. It will tell which group has the permissions based on the compartments specified in the policy. Compartments isolate resources logically only, or in other words, isolate how resources are organized and distributed within your tenancy. The interaction between resources is not affected, and so you can have uh, one VCN in one compartment and one instance located on another compartment attached to that VCN. Your network topology is not affected by how you organize your compartments and resources. Resources can be placed in one compartment, but you can move the resource to another compartment if needed. Compartments are global resources, spawning through all regions. Your tenancy is your root compartment and it contains all the resources in all the regions. The same will apply when you create a new compartment and place resources there. Compartments can be nested up to six level, granting you flexibility in how you will organize your resources. Along with permissions, distribution, and organization of resources, compartments can also be used to set quota policies that will define the number of resources in that compartment. And you can also create budgets that will show how much the resources represent in your bill. When I told you about OCI IAM, I, was mentioning I mentioned authorization and authentication. It is time to show how the IAM concepts related with those two, starting with authentication. Principles can be defined, divided into IAM users and resource principles. We will focus on IAM for now, and later we'll get back on the other two. A collection of users will be defined as a group, and users will be used to assign permissions. A user needs to be authenticated to become a principal. Let me show you how users can authenticate on OCI. The first method is username and password. It is used to access the OCI console. The login page prompts for the username and password. They are validated and the user proceeds. The password can be configured to meet company standards and you can have the option to use multi-factor authentication. API keys is the next method. The users use RSA key pairs to make the authentication. It's used to access the OCI API to use the SDK or the OCI command line interface. The public keys are associated with the IAM users on OCI, and when they need to make API requests, they will provide the private key to authenticate. If the user will only use API keys, they don't need to have a password. But in order to set the public key, they will need, uh, that task will need to be performed by an administrator. Auth tokens are used to third-party systems that are not able to use the API signing key method. OCI will generate token strings that will be used on those systems. One example of a system that uses tokens is the Swift API. Once authenticated, now it's time to know what you can do. This is defined by the IAM policies. Here you can see the basic template of a policy. 
we will break into parts and see what they are. By default, everything is denied on OCI, so the very first part of the statement will be the word allow. The second piece is the subject. The subject represents the who. A subject of a policy can be the wildcard any user, a group, a dynamic group, or a service. The last three can be identified by the name or the OCID of the resource. One important note, since the adoption of identity domains, the subject clause should contain the name of the domain before the name of the group or dynamic group. If it's missing, the default domain will be assumed. Knowing the subject of uh, your statement, let's move to the actions clause. The action clause will define the type of access. From top to bottom, they will increase the amount of power that they have. The inspect verb allows the user to list resources without showing confidential information. It's target to, to external auditors. The read verb allows the user to list resources and see confidential information, which makes internal auditors its use case. The use verb is intended to be used by normal users granting them the ability to use the resources and sometimes modify them. Lastly, the manage verb grants all permissions. The actions clauses are paired with the objects that we're gonna check next. The objects paired with the action clause can be specified as a family aggregator or by the individual service names. Once the action is set, the placement clause will define the location of the resource that the user can manage. With where and condition, uh, and condition clauses, policies can narrow conditions to grant the permissions in this next slide. Can narrow the permissions. In the next slides, we will show some examples of placement and conditions. Let's take a look at some common policies to illustrate when things are put together. In this policy, the subject defines a group and it's set by the name network admins. The action clause is set by Manish and the object it is the virtual network family aggregator. The network resources can be located on any compartment and we are setting the tendency as the placement. The next policy allows the instance launch group to create instances. This second policy has the verb manage and they will, because they will be creating instances. And we are defining that associating with the instance family. When creating the instance, those instances will need to be placed on the compartment ABC. The next policy is for the block volume access and it uses the verb use. This means that the users can use the existing volumes in the compartment ABC, but they cannot create the volumes. Another user with managed permissions will need to create the volumes before they can select to be used by the instance created by the instance launchers group. The last policy, like the previous one, but it's uh, intended for network resources placed anywhere in the tenancy. Let's get a few more examples of policies and show how the where and the condition clause can be applied. Here, the where clause with the conditional request equals Phoenix will limit the ability to the Phoenix region, uh, to, sorry, the limit the ability to the Phoenix admins to manage all resources only in the US West region. The next policy uses the condition where the target compartment must be different from the specified one. If you plan to use this example, please be sure to replace OCID one with a valid compartment OCID. This last policy defines the condition limiting the type of workload set on the database. If you plan to test this example, please remember to replace workload type by a valid value like OLT, OLPT, DW, or JSON. 
When I talked about authentication and principles, I briefly mentioned resource principles. Dynamic groups and resource principles are directly connected. Let's start knowing a bit better what makes a principle. A principle is a caller trying to act on a resource. Once that caller authenticates, it becomes a principle. Previously, we divided principles into user and resource principles. Within resource principles, we have instance, representing the compute instances in the tenancy, service, that represents applications operated by OCI, like the function service, and then resource, that represents resources, like a database instance or a load balancer. Why take the time to explain what is a principle? The same way groups are used to gather similar users, dynamic groups are used to group similar principles represented by infrastructure resources and services. Dynamic groups can be used as subject clauses when you are defining the API calls that can allow that can be allowed by that policy. Differently from the user groups where you assign the user to a group, dynamic groups uses a set of rules to define membership. An example of rule could be the instances that are in a given compartment. As instances are created or deleted in this compartment, the members are automatically adjusted. Let's take a look at some example of rules that can be used to define group membership. Here, the rule can specify a given compartment ID, or the rule could specify a given instance ID, or the rule can specify a given type of resource within a given compartment. In the third example, the rule is filtering the database instances, and in the fourth example, the rule filters the functions and a given compartment ID is also used in both. After creating the dynamic group and having the rules that will populate the group set, creating a policy is no different from the examples that I showed before. The name of the dynamic group will be used in the subject field of the policy, as we can see in this couple of examples. The next concept is the network source. A network source is a set of defined IPs. The IP addresses can be public IP addresses or IP addresses from the VCN within your tenancy. After you create the network source, you can reference it in policies in your tenancy or in the authentication settings to control uh, the origin of the IP addresses. Uh, those were the concepts. And uh, this is a quick recap of all the concepts that we went through. And this concludes our presentation uh, on identity and access management services on OCI. Thank you for interest in, in OCI identity and access management.